Hello, my name is Robert Johnson and today I'm going over Minneapolis Confidential. This was originally from the City Pages and it was published October 11th, 1995. Uh, this is the one I've been having problems getting access to. It's on the Wayback Machine and we will be posting the link. So this is by Dara uh, Moskowitz Grumdahl uh, and we're going to get into it. Some families celebrate their black sheep. Others never speak of them. In some families, the story of the time Aunt Sally was arrested for dancing on a table with sailors is told every Thanksgiving. In others, it's as if it never had happened. The same, of course, is true for cities, states, for regions. Which stories are told and which are conveniently forgotten? We all know about growing up in a little house on the prairie and Jane J. Hill's railroad empire. But what about the little houses on the wrong side of the tracks? This is one version of that story. The dark legends, the scandalous eras, and shady characters. It is a dip in the murkier water swirling around, the sparkling self-image of the city of lakes. A story of shadows in a town that prides itself on its clean, well-lit places. Minneapolis's earliest days were painted in haunted tones. Our city is built around the ghost of Minneapolis, of Mississippi's only falls, located somewhere between 3rd Avenue and Hennepin Avenue bridges. When Father Louis Hennepin got here in 1680, he claimed the falls were 60 feet high, dwarfed only on this continent by Niagara, and that they could be heard for 15 miles on a still day. 120 years later, Lieutenant Zebulon Montgomery Pike, the man who coaxed the Sioux to sell Fort Snelling area for $2,000 sorry, worth of goods, said that the uh, falls fell merely 17 feet. <clears throat> Hennepin then named the falls for his patron saint, St. Anthony, forever obscuring the Sioux name which they had been known. Mirana, curling water, and Oamene, falling water. I probably butchered those. Sorry. The Sioux believed that this core Minneapolis was a creepy place on two counts. Spirit of evil and waters. Onatake uh, lived behind the falls and was given to making frequent and terrible mischief. To make things worse, the falls were also haunted by the ghost of Empato Sapi, Sapa, a young mother who, according to legend, was so heartbroken by her husband's decision to take a second wife that she dressed in her wedding robe, bundled her son, her young son, into her canoe, and as her family watched aghast from the shore, sang her death song and paddled over the falls. It was said that you would forever hear her dirge in the wind coming off the water. On these cheery shores, Minneapolis's first settlers illegally camped. Before 1852, all land extending west of the Mississippi and south from Canada to McGregor, Iowa, was officially Indian land, except for Fort Snelling. Settling in this territory was illegal. That didn't stop the scores of squatters who took up residence in regulation homestead shacks all over Minneapolis, from the Mississippi west to Lake Harriet, between Minnehaha Kink Creek on the south and Shingle Creek to the north. These squatters had every intention of getting rich when the land inevitably became a state. A nation of budding capitalists could only dream of how much money there was to be made in real estate speculation during the westward expansion. According to land pirates, agents acting for interest from the east, gathered in St. Paul to buy the land. Minneapolis now stood on as soon as the government declared it for sale. They were right, of course. A corner plot on Hennepin and 4th Street sold for $16,000 in 1863. In 1891, it went for $132,000, an increase of 8,149%, or 291% annually. But the squatters already camped there responded to the threat of land pirates by forming 
a secret organization that swore publicly to stand by each other to the death and resist by every means known or unknown to the law efforts to displace the squatters claims to their legally occupied land again illegally occupied land these threats so intimidated the land pirates who would have had to live on these lands they purchased until they were legally cleared for resale a prospect that made the situation ripe for ambush and murder that when the government auctioned off the land the squatters found themselves bidding unopposed these settlers had bought up a godforsaken place which they proceeded to christen all saints all saints meaning then meant literally a place where the spirit of the dead mingled with the living a terrifying unchristian place perhaps since it was believed that witches and ghosts couldn't cross the moving stream they thought the land west of the mississippi was especially haunted rife with spirits of the untamed territory sprawling to the west it wasn't until december 1852 that the town's fathers renamed the budding town minneapolis the first portion taken from the dakota for water the second from the greek word for city water city was a name heartily endorsed by all saints temperance advocates who helped inspire the city's many drunkards to let up a little all saints derived much of its income from moonshine saloons and the prostitutes who set up shop to serve the trappers river rats and fort snelling soldiers who drifted through for rest and relaxation r and r in 1856, Minneapolis hired its first police officer, Benjamin Brown. At that time, there were about 4,200 people living in Minneapolis. There had been at least four murders. About At about one murder per thousand inhabitants, that would make Minneapolis's current murder rate look fairly tame. The pioneers built their first jail, but the underpaid sheriffs and jailer didn't care to look in on his prisoners at night. On several occasions, according to Frank Meade's 1899 History of the Police Department and Fire Departments, the enterprising fellows therein caged proceeded to dig themselves out of the prison and leave for parts unknown. Minneapolis didn't bother to lock up drunks. That was one of its attractions. Men from St. Anthony would come here for pleasure of our liquor. Every day, noted the Minneapolis Tribune, our city is visited by denzines of the metropolis of the male persuasion who imbibe freely of the general beverage and so forth they generally take and so forth straight so much so that they have been taken care of until they get better or worse they are frequently taken outside the city limits and told to get which is a very, in general, a done in quick time. However, the few numbers staying home must be. Sorry, how few the numbers staying home must be.